Will there be a tsunami of foreclosures? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Real Estate, Long Island Real Estate with me, Mark Schreier from Century 21 American Homes. I am going to be discussing a new topic today, real estate investing post-pandemic here on Long Island. Again, investing in real estate post-pandemic, is it a good thing? Is it something you should consider? And is there going to be the quote-unquote tsunami of foreclosed properties coming across everybody's table? And should you jump on to that investment bandwagon as a good way to invest your money. And with that, before I introduce my guest here, I'm going to give you a little uh, inquiry I had recently. Somebody was looking to invest for retirement, a millennial looking to invest for retirement, and they wanted to know if it is a good idea to hold off and putting money into an IRA. And I am not a financial planner by any means. I'm just telling you what somebody reached out and asked me this question. And rather than putting it in their IRA, which is 30 years from now when they retire, should they invest in real estate? So hopefully after watching this video, you'll be able to make that determination. So I've been hearing uh, a lot of things, but before I get there, I'm gonna introduce the gentleman sitting next to me that we share the same barber, uh, Quentin Hardy from Movement Mortgage, who is a movement pro uh, mortgage professional. Quentin, can you give me a little more uh, introduction about who you are, where you're from, about your company? And we'll go from there. Sure. I work for Movement Mortgage with the number six purchase lender in the United States. So even if you haven't heard the name, we're one of the big, uh, big mortgage lenders. Um, our office is in Huntington, New York, Long Island. That's where I'm located, Long Island Market. I've been in the industry for 17 years. I am a loan producer, originator, as well as a manager of a, of a team that is growing. Oh, Great. And, 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 and an author. Guys, a published author. Yes. So I've written a couple of books on home ownership, first time home buyer process, and you can find those on Amazon. I'm, uh, Quentin J. Hardy. If you look me up, you'll find my author page and any of the books that I've written. And one other thing he did not tell you, his AKA is the qualifier. He's yeah, yeah. Known as the qualifier. If you look him up on social media, you will see his other personality. Hashtag the qualifier. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't wear any qualifier gear today. I just got a movement no, t-shirt. not wearing qualifier gear today. All right, All right. Next time. To get on the topic, I am a, on YouTube. I watch a lot of YouTube videos, and I'm hearing a lot of things about the tsunami of bank-owned properties or foreclosures coming in our direction. And I actually speak to a lot of people who are involved in the foreclosure process, realtors who specialize in REOs, which are bank-owned properties, and they have one perspective on what's going to happen post-pandemic. And Quentin, and I invited him on for this reason specifically, he has a, in, a, in a different type of perspective from a mortgage banker perspective. And I thought it was very important to share that with you guys watching when you decide what you want to do when it comes to um, where you want to put your money, whether it be a retirement fund for the future, you know, utilizing real estate, or just know what's going on in the actual investment market moving forward from this pandemic. So number one, for, we're going to discuss forbearance, we're going to discuss the economy, and whether or not uh, people have been saving money. And the, the actual investors that I'm speaking to think that number one, forbearance is the key that is going to knock everybody into worst economic times than they've been in because a lot of people took this forbearance and Quentin will explain a little more detail what forbearance is. And then they didn't save the money that the bank allowed them to not pay at this time. So they're going out, you know, doing whatever it is they're doing, spending money. And not only I believe is it your actual mortgage payment, but your escrow uh, is attached to that. So now we have two payments that people have not been saving for some, I wouldn't say all, but the investors are thinking they're not going to be able to uh, recover from this once they find out how much money they're going to owe when the bank lifts that foreclosure process. Thus, the tsunami of foreclosures are going to just hit the market and these people are going to be in dire need of something and then the banks are just going to foreclose on the property and the gluttony of foreclosures are going to be all over the place. That's what I'm hearing from investors. 
That's what I'm hearing from people who are looking to buy bank owned properties. So Quinn, as a mortgage guy, please share your outlook for the future when it comes to forbearance and what you believe as a banker, the REO scenario is gonna be like. Sure, now of, of course, we always have to understand for in New York state, for example, I think we have, we, historically we have it, we may still be the longest state from the time you miss a payment to the time you go into foreclosure. So the properties that are coming on the market, they didn't just get foreclosed upon two or three months ago. Sometimes it was years ago. So we always have to understand that the inventory that we're going to see immediately after the pandemic ends is not new inventory, it's the old inventory. So then the question becomes, all right, when is this forbearance? Now, if, if that's the question, when does this forbearance start to create this tsunami, as you used the, the word tsunami of, uh, of foreclosures, is there's a few other things to consider is whenever someone gives me these, these predictions, I always ask, well, why? If they go, it's a bubble, the market's gonna go down. Okay, well, why? And are we comparing it to other markets? What is, what is driving, what data is driving what you're saying? And in this case, when they say, well, all these forbearance people didn't save the money and they're not gonna be able to make those payments, that's not true. And I'll explain why. At the very beginning of the pandemic, there's an industry publication in real estate and mortgage called Housing Wire. And they reached out to me and they asked me to write an article about forbearance. And everything I wrote two weeks later was wrong. Now they, they published it because it was right when I published it. But what ended up happening is Fannie, Freddie, the quasi governmental institutions that lend the money changed the rules. The way it initially worked at the beginning of the pandemic when forbearance was, was, was announced and given and pushed is that you would go into forbearance, but six months later when you wanted to come out, you had to make all six payments. And that would have been a danger that yes, would have caused a tsunami of, of foreclosures because a lot of the people, they didn't save a year's worth of mortgage payment. They were going them into forbearance because they couldn't make the payment. So you can't expect them to have, you know, three, six, nine, 12 months worth of mortgage payment when it's over. That tsunami, however, was stemmed by the fact that Fannie, Freddie, FHA, they all changed the rules once they offered the people pen, uh, the, the, during the, the pandemic, they changed the forbearance rules once they offered the people forbearance. So now it stands that with FHA, for example, if you go into forbearance, when you want to come out, they take whatever you owe and they put it as a secondary lien behind the first lien. So you don't have to go back and pay three, six, nine months right away. You can pay that money whenever you're ready, when you sell the property, when you refinance it. So you can just catch up and start paying from wherever you are. Fannie and Freddie do it a little bit differently, but essentially the same kind of thing. So the way it's happening is that most people will have a very, very comfortable, easy way out of forbearance. I stop paying and I can just start paying again. That's it. I don't have to do anything else. So it doesn't matter if they saved anything, those people are going to automatically be back on board and moving forward. So there, there won't be any foreclosure issues. That, that's number one with forbearance. The economy, my prediction is from looking at the people right now at the open houses with current strong pre-approvals making offers on property that yes, there are plenty of people who are in dire straits who are hit hard by this um, uh, economy and the, the pandemic that we're in, but there are also plenty of people out there with substantial amounts of money some industries have actually thrived. So there's new uh, businesses that have been created. One, you know, would be uh, the happy birthday signs I see on everybody's lawn, which I never knew existed. Those people, that, that's a business that just popped up. And people, some people are um, doing very well. So the economy, as it comes to buying and selling houses on Long Island, it's one of the strongest markets Long Island has experienced. And from speaking to other realtors in the other states, a lot of states are experiencing very low inventory of home, homes that are available to sell. And when they go on the market, they are selling quickly. And for, like I mentioned before, at or above asking price. So the economy when it comes to home sales is very strong. Moving forward, we are also in what we call a um, moratorium on actual foreclosures, where we are in a state of emergency here in New York State, and they are not allowed to evict people from their homes. 
But like Quentin mentioned, there are some people who were the eviction process already started and it was frozen. So when the actual floodgates open per se, because of COVID, and this is some of the information that some of these investors have shared with me, they deal with court systems all the time. The court systems are slowed down. They don't work at 100% capacity. They're gonna be working maybe at 50% capacity with all the social distancing and all these other rules and regulations. So what I'm trying to get at is, will there be a tsunami of foreclosures? I don't foresee a tsunami of foreclosures. There will definitely be more than there are right now because right now there is an eviction, non-eviction clause and the whole system, the only people who are leaving are the people who voluntarily want to leave their homes because they know once that eviction clause is lifted, they might be one of the first people that need to find a place to live. So if they were able to secure another living quarters right now, they might move on. So tsunami, I'm predicting no. Will the amount of foreclosures increase from the, the number they are now? I believe so. Will they go back to pre-COVID conditions? My prediction is most likely, and I will share one other scenario, and Quentin can probably back this up. About 10, 14 years ago, I started in real estate. The foreclosures on Long Island was such an anomaly. It didn't really exist. It was down south, out west. I had never seen a foreclosed property out here that readily on Long Island. And then the last five years, they were popping up a lot. It could be that I was involved in an organization or a brokerage firm that has a lot of a big REO department, but I would see them pretty much a lot more than before. So that is a common play here on Long Island. And I believe it's going to revert back pretty much to where it was pre-pandemic. Quinton, thoughts about that? You agree, disagree? I think everything you're saying makes sense because there, there's other things that we have to consider. In 2010, there were a million foreclosures across the United States. In 2020, there were 50,000. So it's way, way down. Now, obviously that's an anomaly. So some of those 2020 people or 2020 foreclosures that should have come to market won't come out till this year or maybe next year. But there's also some dramatic differences between our market now and last time we had a lot of foreclosures. One of them is the values. And we've seen about a 10% increase in real estate values across the country. So that person who maybe had a house for four or 500,000 a year ago, that house is worth 440 or 550, which makes it easier for them to sell and harder to foreclose because they've got more value in the property, which is, so now they can get out of it. They can short sell it. They're not likely to be underwater. That's number one. Number two is we didn't have the subprime loans these last few years, like we had at the 2020 you know, issues. So there are people who, for the most part, have been doing 100% financing and not proving their income and, and doing some of the, the stated, or, or I should say, uh, subprime loans that cause a lot of the issues. The other thing is that 2010, and uh, last time we had a lot of foreclosures, we had the highest amount of inventory that we had ever seen. Well, right now we have the lowest amount of inventory we've ever seen. So a lot of the foreclosures happened last time because you couldn't put your house in the market and sell it because there was five other houses on your block. Now, there's, according to the Wall Street Journal, there are more realtors than there are homes for sale. How's that for a new statistic? I think that was always the case. I think the, <laughs> the National Association of Realist, uh, Realtors is one of the largest in the country um, with realtors. Yes. Uh, well, very see, good. And this, this is a statistic I don't hear a lot. Is, and I know in 2020, a lot of people say the rich got richer and the poor got poorer. But a lot of those rich that got richer are homeowners. And the people who are suffering the most very frequently are the renters. Because like we said, the rich got richer simply because if you owned a home, you probably saw five to 10% appreciation almost no matter where you live in the country. But an, another statistic that I, I like numbers and, and fact driven stuff, a lot of people are not aware of. At the end of 2019, the checking and savings accounts across the United States had about $800 million by, sorry, $800 billion by the end of, 2020, it was 1.8 trillion. So it had about doubled. So imagine that the checking and savings accounts for many Americans doubled. Nope. So these people have money to pay their, their mortgage. They're, they're not suffering. They're not in a financial bind. And like you said, there are a lot of businesses that went down. There are also a lot of businesses that went up. So we, we can't assume that just because there's a, a lot of economic strife, 
it seems to be it's skewed more towards the people who maybe weren't homeowners. Um, and we, we talk about forbearance. There's also a lot of people who took forbearance who didn't need it because that, that when forbearance first came out, that was one of the challenges. They said there's no guideline. Last time that I saw a lot of forbearance was Hurricane Sandy. And the people had to show a reason why they would get it. This time the government said anybody who wants it can get it. So I had just this. Now, this is anecdotal, but I'm sure statistically across the country, this is not unique. I was speaking with a gentleman who's a teacher and he's in forbearance. And I said, why are you in forbearance? You're a teacher. Your income's the same. He goes, yeah, but when it was first announced, all the people in the break room were like, hey, you don't have to pay your mortgage for half a year or for a year. We should take it. And everybody took it. None of them need it. And none of them, they all got raises, <laughs> but, but they took it. I spoke to a gentleman who owns a couple of pizza parlors and he was freaking out because when, when things were shutting down, he's like, I don't know what's going to happen to my business. This is going to be terrible. I, I got to take forbearance. I don't know if my business is going to survive. Spoke to him a few months later. He's still in forbearance. He goes, business is better than ever. I mostly take out. So now I'm actually doing more business and I had a more profitable year than I did before, but he took forbearance. So people like that have taken it, don't need it, and they're going to roll out of it without a problem. Very, very good point. And also some people, again, when they heard free money, uh, as people who are involved in investing and have a very good discipline when it comes to being able to invest and not spend that money on, you know, uh, and, and throw it away per se, saw again that they could put that money in other areas, gain interest on it. And if they have a low, like three or 4% mortgage already, uh, that's sort of free money for them. Now, what I will say, the beginning of this um, particular video, we were talking about whether or not, about the person who asked me, should they put money in real estate as a means, you know, to invest in this and that. Real estate, uh, you, you hear both sides now. Is the tsunami, is it coming? I believe it's not. Quentin sort of backing it up with what's going on. People like in 08, when we had the big economic or the big uh, real estate bubble crash, people were underwater, now they're not. So the answer to the question is, should you invest in real estate? Well, you're gonna have to listen to my side that I gave you of the investors. Quint inside and ultimately the decision is yours. Definitely speak to your financial planner, speak to people that are into real estate that you know and respect that uh, have been doing it for a while. And you have to make your own decision. As a realtor, I will tell you, I am a little biased. I believe real estate is a great investment tool and Quentin shared something similar. But a lot of people, and I know some people also that decided to take the forbearance because they didn't have to pay. They weren't in any you know, um, financial problems whatsoever, but it was a free gift from the government for them and they decided to jump on and take it. Now I will mention, I'm also a big Dave Ramsey fan and Dave Ramsey, if you don't know who he is, is totally against taking most sort of loans from in any way, shape or form. And he would be against taking free money because you can get yourself in a lot of hot water. So if you want to, if you believe in that, if you know you're that type of person that if you take this money, you're going to end up going on a vacation once the uh, travel restrictions are lifted and not pay it back or pay it back when you get a chance, then this type of situation, you know, is something you really need to think about. Uh, with that being said, Quentin, you have any last uh, comments or tips? This has been great information about forbearance, about this tsunami of um, real estate foreclosures coming our way and whether it is or not. But Quentin Hardy from Movement Mortgage, any uh, last tips in closing you'd like to share? Tell us again where you're located, your company, and you specialize in renovation loans for people and maybe who want to buy a foreclosure or any other type of loans? Hint, hint. That's a softball. Yeah, I do a lot of renovation loans. It's, uh, it's nearly 50% of my business. Um, I was the number one producer of renovation loans for my prior lender, number one in the country. And uh, I've been the number one lender, number one in the country here for renovation loans for movement several years. So, yeah, I do a lot of renovation loans. That's how I got connected to your team and uh, working with a lot of foreclosures and REOs. So I, I like doing those. But I do all kinds of loans. You can look me up on Amazon to find my book. Uh, you could also go to www.yourqualifier.com if you want to buy the book directly and uh, there'll be some of my other information there. But I think what we said at the beginning is whenever anyone's saying, pr making predictions of the future for any sort of market, always ask, okay, that sounds great. 
why and listen to the rationale, the reasoning and the data behind it. What is driving that? Not just accept it, what's driving it? Great. Uh, as Quentin knows, and as I'm learning, this channel, my channel is actually getting national exposure. I'm getting comments and uh, phone calls from people all over the country. So I deal only on Long Island. I have a referral network that's actually national where I can hook you up to a, a um, pre-qualified realtor in whatever state you might have real estate business in. And Quentin, you are licensed in which states to help our viewers out if they want to contact you? Uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Florida. Okay, so we got Quentin in the states he just mentioned. I have a national referral network. If you are definitely have some sort of um, question or concern about real estate, by all means, contact me, send me an email, text me. My contact information will be below in the uh, comments, as well as Quentin Hardy from Movement Mortgage. I want to thank you guys. I hope you will. Actually, I got to find out. I made that sign. I got the wrong finger. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications so you can, again, get push notifications whenever new videos come up. I want to thank Quentin Hardy, and we will both see you, or I'll see you, on the next video. Yeah.